The makers of Campbell Soup present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Gentlemen, this is Orson Welles. The late William Archer was as formidable a gentleman as you would wish to meet. From 1884 to 1923, he wrote dramatic criticism for almost every important paper in England. And almost every American and English playwright at one time or another winced beneath his pen lashings. Then later in life, he developed a secret passion, a disgraceful passion for a dramatic critic. He wanted to write a play. Mr. Archer was a very thorough old gentleman. The first thing he did was to write a book in which he explained exactly and in great detail how plays should be written. It became a classic. No young playwright since then would dream of writing a play without carefully consulting and following the rules and dictates laid down by Mr. William Archer. No young playwright, that is, except Mr. William Archer, who at the age of 63 sat down and wrote a play in which he took care to break every single one of the rules that he set down in his manual. It was called the Raja of Rook. Changed to the Green Goddess. Opened on December 27th, 1920 at the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia with Mr. George Arliss in the leading part and was an immediate and overwhelming success. Ladies and gentlemen, it only remains for me to tell you that our guest tonight is the star of such fine motion pictures as The 39 Steps, The General Dies at Dawn, The Prisoner of Zender, and the new Paramount Picture Cafe Society, the beautiful and talented Madeline Carroll. But before we begin, a word from Ernest Chappell. Not so many years ago, tomato soup and cream of tomato were unusual dishes, enjoyed very much, but not very often. Today, of all the soups in the world, tomato soup is the one most often served. Not because women have taken to making tomato soup frequently. No, on the contrary, few housewives ever attempt it anymore. There's just one reason for tomato soup's popularity, and it is this. The magic, matchless flavor of Campbell's tomato soup. There's a lively verve, a dashing zest about this flavor that people take to at once and come back to and enjoy again and again. The first racy taste of it has a way of arousing a desire to eat, and yet there's a pleasant feeling of satisfaction when the last spoonful is gone. So this soup is a happy choice for the main dish at lunchtime or at supper, and it also is a fine way to start the day's main meal. Serve it sometimes, too, as cream of tomato, made with milk instead of water. You can always be sure that it will be received with pleasure, because this, of all soups, is the one people like to have most often, Campbell's tomato soup. And now for Miss Madeline Carroll, Mr. Orson Welles, and the Green Goddess. <laughs> Sent me over. Major Crichton and his wife were passengers on Dr. Cahern's plane. 
Uh, how long ago was it last missing? Forty minutes. One minute long to be flying blind in a Himalayan fog, sir. Oh, you're a confounded pessimist, Dawson. Well, I've done some flying over the Himalayas, Captain. Well, could you um, possibly make a fourth landing? Yes, in one of the valleys. But I'd almost rather he'd take a mountain right in the face. Those wild beggars in the interior. Oh, no, nonsense, Johnson. They wouldn't dare molest the British subjects. Oh, wouldn't they? Three of the devils just shot down one of our deputies right here in Amal Sarai. Yes, and they're going to hang for it. Well, you can't hang all the savages in those mountains, Captain. Not even the British no, government. Try again, Dawson. Right, oh, sir. Fast, going so much fast. Running short of petrol, I must make a landing. Then nothing but mountains all around. I'd take a chance for the valley. I'm trying to get under the fog. Looks like a peak straight ahead. I see it. I'll nose down to the right. Near the hole in the fog. Anthony, your glasses. Quick, on my side. Good. I see a green patch. Poison alert. Careful if you drive. Steady. I'll bank. If the petrol holds up. There's a clearing in the woods. A castle or something. I see it. About a thousand feet, a little to the left. No use. That was gone. Nothing to castle. Major, the door of Mrs. Mrs. Preston's side. Open it. Oh, tell everybody. Here we go. Easy there. Take it easy, everyone. Are you hurt? Tell her. I'm all right. How about it, Traherne? No use. Fell a smash. We have to depend on the natives. Perhaps we could get word to that palace we saw up on the hill. Well, the natives did that for us, Priscilla. Listen. Keeping at a safe distance. They're scared of us. No wonder the way we landed. Hmm. I wonder what sort of place we struck. Look over there. Right above us. That statue. By Joe. What a creature. Oh, isn't she? One... Two, three, four. Six arms. What a horrible color. Some goddess they worship. Kali, I shouldn't wonder. Well, let's have a close look at the lady. Anthony, they don't want you near the statue. The devil is what they want. Nature, I wouldn't anger them. Think of your wife. I'm quite able to take care of myself and my wife, too, Dr. Zahern. Please, Anthony. We've got to show them we're friendly. Try talking to them in Hindustan. Hello. You were splendid, Lucilla, all through. I had faith in you. If I'd had another pint of petrol. But I simply had to trust your luck. It wasn't luck. It was you that saved the staff. Oh, there's no use. They can't understand it. We must be well into Central Asia. Rook! 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 Rock? Where's that? Why, I've heard that name recently. Rook, I can't remember exactly. I remember. Anthony, see if that Calcutta paper is still in the cockpit. Yeah, I got there. I was reading it on the way. I may have thrown it in. No, hey, yes, it is still in my pocket. I read something just this morning. Let me have it. Probably on the province dispatches. Yes, yes, this is the paragraph. Abdullahabad, Tuesday. Sentence of death has been passed on three men found guilty of the murder of Mr. Haredale, agent of His Majesty's government. It appears these criminals are inhabitants of Rook, a small and little-known independent state among the northern spurs of the Himalayas. That's it. Rook, I read it too. And by the way, this news isn't the best possible passport for three Englishmen. But if we're a hundred miles from anywhere, it can't be known yet. Oh, they won't dare touch us. Well, I think I'll burn this page. Have you got a match, Preston? Yeah, there you are. Thanks. Well, there she goes. Just in case there's anyone here who can read. Look out. They're watching this doctor. Where was that? Look. Figures moving through the trees. The second some thought. So it is by the heavens. In uniform. Oh, putting out their best foot for us, eh, Doctor? Well, I hope it's a friendly gesture. I don't like their looks very much. What's that in the center? They're carrying someone on a letter. Look at the gold on it. It's probably the Roger. Try to show them my revolver, but he may go. We didn't take our chances on their being friendly. Anthony, try to explain to him. Now, see if he knows the Hindustani. Yapura Kataran. Yapura Kijapija Tapa. Yamur Tapa. There's no use, the ignorant beggar probably only knows some tribal language. Looks like I have with that gun. But right up! You know what I say? I am a I 
bid you welcome to my humble kingdom. Oh, your, your Highness speaks English. Then I can apologize for our landing uninvited in your territory. Uninvited, but I assure you, not unwelcome. Well, we're, we're, we're given to understand that this is a state of rock. To the kingdom of Rook, Major. Major, if I rightly read the symbols of military rank on your cup. Major Kirsten. Permit me to introduce my wife. I am delighted, madame, to welcome you to my secluded dominion. You are the first lady of your nation I have had the honor of receiving. Your Highness is very kind. And uh, this is Dr. Basil Treherne, whose airplane, uh, or what's left of it, you see. Dr. Treherne. The Canadian Dr. Treherne, whose name I have so often seen in the newspaper, the Pasteur of Malaria. Well, the newspapers make too much of my work. Very incomplete. But you're an aviator as well. Only an amateur. I presume it is some misadventure, most fortunate misadventure for me that has carried you so far into the wilds of the Himalayas. Uh, yes, we got lost in the flowers. City. On our way to Bahari, from Amir Sarai. Major Preston is stationed there. I offered to take him in my plane. I'm afraid it was a rash suggestion. Madame is a sportswoman, then. Oh, I've been up many times. Yes, many times. Well, you've made a sensation here, I can assure you. My people have never seen an aeroplane. They are not sure, simple souls. Whether you are gods or demons. But the fact of your having descended in the precincts of a temple of our local goddess, uh, allow me to introduce you to her, is considered highly significant. Uh, is your machine fast prepare, Dr. Trahan? Utterly, I'm afraid. Let us look at it. I guess. Propeller smashed. Plane crumpled up. Under carriage wreck. I am afraid we can't offer to repair the damage for you. I'm afraid not, sir. A wonderful machine. Yes. Europe has something to boast of. I wonder what the priest here thinks of it. <laughs> He uh, says it's the great rock, the giant bird, you know, of our eastern stories. And he declares that he plainly saw his goddess uh, hovering over you as you descended and guiding you towards her temple. Uh, hope so. We, we shall find no difficulty in obtaining transport back to, civ- uh, to, to India. To civilization, you are going to say. Why hesitate, my dear sir? We know very well that we are barbarians. We are quite reconciled to the fact. We have had some 5,000 years to accustom ourselves to it. This sword is a barbarous weapon compared with your revolver, but it was worn by my ancestors when yours were daubing themselves blue and picking up a precarious livelihood in the woods. But Madame is standing all this time. Watkins! Your Highness. Uh, Watkins, what are you thinking of? Some cushions, a litter for Madame, and mountain chairs for gentlemen. They'll be here in a few minutes. And then I hope you will accept the hospitality of my poor house. I'm afraid we've given you a great deal of trouble, Your Highness. A great deal of pleasure, madame. I hope, sir, there will be no difficulty about obtaining the transport back to India. Uh, time enough to talk of that, Major, when you have rested and recuperated after your adventure. You will do me the honour of dining with me this evening, I trust. Yes, Your Highness, there's nothing to wear but what we're in. Oh, I think we can put that all right. Uh, Watkins. Your Honour. You are in the confidence of our mistress of the robes. How does our wardrobe stand? Fresh consignments of Paris models come in only last week, Your Highness. Good. Then I hope, madame, that you may find among them some rag that you will deign to wear. Paris models, Your Highness? And you talk of being uncivilized. We do what we can, madame. I sometimes have the pleasure of entertaining European ladies, though not the two English women in my solitudes, and I like to mitigate the terrors of exile for them. And then, as for civilization, you know, I always have at my elbow one of its most finished products. Watkins, Your Honor. You will recognize in Watkins, gentlemen, another representative of the ruling race. I assure you, he rules me with an iron hand, not always in a velvet glove. Hey, Watkins. Your Honor, we'll have your little guy here. He's my prime minister and all my cabinet, but more particularly, my Lord Chamberlain. No one can touch him at mixing a cocktail or making a salad. My entire household trembles at his nod. Even my ship quails before him. Nothing comes amiss to him, for he is like myself a man without prejudices. I have sometimes thought of instituting a peerage in order that I might raise Watkins to it, but I mustn't let my admiration for British institutions carry me too far, must I? Ah, here comes the litter. Uh, Permit me, madam, to hand you to your panacan. Thank you, Your Highness. I see you have a newspaper, madam. A recent paper is such a rarity. You must allow me to glance at it. Of course. Ah, the telegraph news is gone. What a pity. In my seclusion, I hunger for tidings from the civilized world. Well, I'm sorry, Your Highness. I tore out that color. Ah. Well, I know your motive, Dr. Tohern, and I appreciate it. You destroyed it out of consideration for my feelings, wishing to spare me a painful piece of intelligence. That was very thoughtful, but quite unnecessary. I already know what you tried to conceal. No. 
I know that three of my subjects, accused of a political crime, have been sentenced to death. How is it possible? Sir, we have a saying here in the East. Good news travels on the back of a tortoise, but bad news flies with the eagle. Uh, but one thing you can perhaps tell me, is there any chance of their sentences being remitted? You're afraid not, Your Highness. Uh, remitted? I should rather say not. It was a cold-blooded, unprovoked murder. Unprovoked. Unprovoked, you think? Well, I won't argue the point. The execution is to be, I think, tomorrow or the day after. Tomorrow or the day after, yes. Uh, forgive me, madame. I've kept you waiting. You'll proceed at once. Your Highness seems so interested. Does Your Highness know anything of these men? Know them? Oh, yes. Yes, Doctor, I do know them. They are my brothers. Panari, Army Post, to Hanu Karai. Your message received. No, sign plain, you describe. Ready to seek, missing plane. Please advise, location, last known. Mahari. No, the devil, all right. Petro couldn't last. If they'd only made a landing. If they had, Cretson would have rigged up their wireless on the ground. He's a good hand at it. You're a comforting soul, Dawson. One of those born obituary writers. Well, I don't see no reason to feel cheerful. Well, uh, keep it coming. I'll ask the colonel about orders for Mahari. Oh, uh, by the way, advise mountain stations... The three murderers of Headale are sentenced to be hanged tomorrow at sunset. Might serve as a warning. Right, Chief. To all mountain stations. Three murderers of Headale are sentenced to be hanged. Excellent dinner, Roger. I dinner, how you manage a gourmet piece of this savage country. <laughs> Major, you English feel civilization is your peculiar possession. Oh, my husband didn't mean that, Your Highness. Naturally, we didn't expect such splendor in your mountain kingdom. Thank you, madam. My humble castle is indeed splendid if it pleases you. But I must really replenish this cellar all day. My ancestors had no notion of comfort. They had considerable notion of a view, I should say, when they built this lotion. I never felt closer to the stars. My dear doctor, is that a premonition or an observation? Dr. Cahern is uh, quite an astronomer. Oh, well, not exactly an astronomer. I can pick out a few constellations, that's all. For my part, I look at the stars as little as possible. Today I was guilty of a little showing off when I met you with fanfare and truth. <laughs> Think of the Maharaja up yonder, who night after night whistles up his glittering legions, as much as to say, see what a devil of a fellow I am. I think it's quite in good taste. <laughs> I'm afraid you're jealous, Roger. You don't like having to play second fiddle to a still more absolute ruler than yourself. Yes, perhaps you're right, madame. That's it, party, then. But there's something much more to it. I can't help resenting. Let me recommend the brandy, Major. I think you'll find it excellent. Uh, it is indeed. Uh... What is it you resent, Your Highness? Oh, uh, the respect paid to mere size. To the immensity, as they call it, of the universe. Are we to worship a god because he's big? But if you resent his bigness, what do you say to his littleness? The microscope, you know, reveals him no less than the telescope. And reveals him in the form of a death-dealing speck of matter, which you, I understand, Doctor, are impiously proposing to exterminate. I am trying to marshal the life saving against the death-dealing power. To marshal God's right hand against his left, eh? This mosquito that I've just killed. I'm glad to see you smoke, madame, to help to keep them off. This mosquito, or any smallest thing that has life in it, is to be far more admirable than a whole lifeless universe. Hmm? What do you say, Major? I say, Roger, that you'd give me another glass of brandy. I'll let you have your own way about the universe. <laughs> it's a very satisfactory trade. Your glass, Major. Thanks. I, I say, I just, all this is rather out of my depth. We've had rather a fatiguing day. To be sure, to be sure. We are now going to committee upon your position here. Hey, you please, sir. I'm afraid you may find it rather disagreeable. Uh, communication's bad, eh? We have a difficult journey before us. Mm -hmm. A long journey, yes, yes. 
not to find it difficult. Well, it surely can't be so very far, since you'd heard, you'd heard of the sentence passed on those assassins. I'm glad, Major, that you have so tactfully spared the pain of reopening that subject. We should have had to come to it sooner or later. But when your highness said they were your brothers, you were, of course, speaking figuratively. You meant your tribesmen. Oh, not at all. No. They are sons of my father. They're not of my mother. And we come upon you at such a time, how great. Oh, pray don't apologize. Believe me, your arrival has given me great satisfaction. How do you mean? I'll explain pleasantly, but first... Of... First, let's understand each other. You surely can't approve of this abominable crime. My brothers are fanatics, and there is no fanaticism in me. My education was wholly European. I shed all my prejudices. I became the open-minded citizen of the world whom I hope you recognize in me. My brothers, on the other hand, turned to India for their culture... The religion of our people has always been a primitive idolatry. My brothers naturally fell in with the adherence of the same superstition, and they worked each other up to a high pitch of frenzy against the European uh, exploitation of Asia. You, you, you mean, sir, you, you defend this wicked murder? Oh, no, I think it foolish and futile. Uh, but there is a romantic as well as a practical side to my nature. And from the romantic point of view, I rather admire it. Then, sir, the less we intrude on your hospitality, the better. You'll be good enough to furnish us with transport tomorrow morning. That is just where the difficulty arises. Oh, transport, eh? Uh, materially, it might be managed. But morally, I fear... Excuse the colloquialism, but I'm no go. What the blazes do you mean, sir? Will your highness be good enough to explain? I mentioned that the religion of my people is a primitive superstition. Well, since the news has spread that three Ferengis have dropped from the skies, precisely at the time when three princes of the royal house are threatened with death at the hands of the Ferengi government and drop her over in the precincts of a temple. My subjects have got it into their heads that you have been personally conducted hither by the goddess whom they especially worship. The goddess? Uh, here's a portrait on the mantelpiece. Much admired by Carnassius. Then the upshot of all this palaver is that you propose a whole lot of hostages in exchange for your brothers. That is not precisely the idea, my dear sir. My theologians do not hold that an exchange is what the goddess decrees. Uh, nor, to be quite frank... It ought to get to suit my purpose. Not to get your brothers back again? You may have noted in history, madame, that family affection is seldom a strong point of principle. But I don't quite see, Your Highness, what all this has to do with us. We are approaching the crux of the matter, a point which I fear you may have some difficulties appreciating. I would beg you to remember that though I am what is commonly called an autocrat, there is no such thing under the sun as a real despotism. All government is government by consent of the people. It's very stupid of them to consent, but they do. I decide their prejudices or their passions. They could upset my throne tomorrow. Will you be so kind as to come to the point, sir? Gently, Major, gently. We shall reach it soon enough. Please remember, too, that I am a slave to theology. The clerical party can do what it pleases with me. Please, Your Highness, you're torturing The point is, dear lady, that this theology on which, as I say, my whole power is founded has not yet emerged from a very primitive state of development. It demands an eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. A life for a life. You need to say... Unfortunately, I do. You kill us? Not I, madame. The clerical party. And only if my brothers are executed. If not, I will merely demand your word of honor that what has passed between us should never be mentioned in you. So, if you go free. But if your brother are sat in the hanged, as they certainly will be, you... You have put us to death in cold blood. Oh, not in cold blood, Major. There is nothing cold-blooded about the clerical party when white goats, as their phrase goes, are to be sacrificed to the goddess. What of this discretion? Does your goddess demand the life of a woman? Well, on that point, she might not be too exacting. If Madame would be so gracious as to favor me with her. So your Highness, not a word, now I'll shoot you. Anthony. No use, Major. That gun wouldn't help you a bit. If you killed me, you'd only be torn to pieces instead of beheaded. We'll take our chances. Besides, I've had your pistol unloaded. That precaution was taken while you were at your bath. You devil. Anthony, please. I gather, madame, that my offer does not please you. Well, I scarcely hoped it would. I do not press the point. Nonetheless, the suggestion 
Okay. Well, that sounds interesting. If you wait a few minutes, I may have some news for you. I recognize the service call, a message to the air base. I'm your sir. I excuse you. Well, Watkins? The army post. Oh, you're right. What do they say? Just a moment, I miss. Sorry, army post. When you survive. No sign, plane, you describe. Ready to seek missing plane. Please advise location. Last now. Much good that will do them. Out of contact, what? He is in that air, Honest. It's for man he was arrived. Two all mountain stations. Three murderers of Airedale sentenced to be hanged tomorrow at Sang. Send it off. That's all I need to know. Yes, Your Honest. I find your friends are very interested in your whereabouts. What, sir? Amir Sarai is transmitting messages to Bahari and Bahari to Amir Sarai. How do you know? Why, Major, you're an army man. You must know something of wireless. Never had occasion. I had operators in my command. And you, Dr. Tahern? I know even less than the Major. We heard those sounds, of course, when you went out. You see, Doctor, we are not entirely benighted. We have a wireless installation. Did you have anything further to tell us, Your Highness? Yes. I'm afraid not very good news. My brother's execution is fixed for tomorrow. And tomorrow? Yes. That comes it. But meanwhile, I hope you will regard my poor house as your own. I should not advise you to pass the palace gates. It will not be safe. Your Highness. Yes, madame. I can't believe that you really mean what you've told us tonight. Perhaps you're testing us, having fun at our expense. Will you please now, for my sake, communicate with Amul Sarai and bring about an exchange? Your brother's lives for ours. No, madame. I am desolated to have to refuse you. It is always difficult to refuse a beautiful woman anything. And you are a very beautiful woman. But you must not ask for the impossible. I've already given you my reason. And what's to prevent us from throwing ourselves from that low jar onto the rocks below? From cheating your... your goddess? Nothing, dear lady, except... that... with that clinging to the known and shrinking from the unknown that all of us feel. And besides, you cannot read my mind... As you suggested a moment ago, I may only be playing a little joke on you. You have observed that I have a sense of humor. <laughs> I'm afraid I've been talking a great deal. And I doubt my servant will take you to your room. Ya, ya! You will see that Madame has everything she needs for her comfort. And may I hope that you will rest well in my humble abode. Good night, Anthony. Basil. Good night, my dear. Good night, Lucilla. If... If there is anything, madame, that is not entirely to your liking, I trust you will not hesitate to make your wishes known. Good night, madame. And now, gentlemen, tomorrow we have all day. Shall we start with a game of billiards? Say, at ten o'clock. Mm, now, last whiskey and soda. <laughs> no? Then good night. Good night. You are listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Green Goddess, Starring Madeline Carroll and Orson Welles. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chappell, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse... In a moment or two, we shall resume our presentation of The Green Goddess, starring Orson Welles and Madeline Carroll. Leaving our guest star as an uneasy dinner companion of the Rajah, whose table talk was so disturbing, though the service, I'm sure, was flawless, let's consider this question of food in the drama. So many plays have been written around meals or have featured meals, you can't get through an English drawing room comedy without at least one afternoon tea or a Noel Coward play without breakfast. 
In Old English, George Hollis solved all his problems by eating a dinner so good and so elaborate that it killed him. And dinner at eight wove the threads of half a dozen dramas into the preparations for a dinner party that was just about to start as the final curtain fell. The reason that meals have such an important part in plays is that meals and meal times form an all-important center of our social life, a sort of hub, so to speak, around which all our doings revolve. Meals from the beginning of our society have been the occasion and the backbone of entertaining and the focal center of the family. Few things bind people together more than the sharing of meals, provided those meals are gracious and graciously served. Perhaps it sounds exaggerated to say that a meal can't help but be a gracious occasion if soup is on the menu. But it does mean something that for centuries past, soup has been the traditional opening of dinner in many countries, countries whose habits differed in almost every other particular. Soup is at once relaxing and invigorating. Soup greets us at the table with a warm welcome, and this is particularly true of Campbell's tomato soup. Its rich aroma and bright color flash in appeal to eye and appetite. And its sprightly flavor makes you want to enjoy it again and again. So serving this soup becomes a happy family custom and adds a gracious note when you have friends in for dinner. Now we resume our Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Green Goddess, starring Madeline Carroll and Orson Welles. <laughs> Shot, Major. I see billiards is another of your many attainments. <laughs> I miss that one. <laughs> Too bad. Too bad. Let's try my luck. Hmm. An easy one. I try a three cushion shot now. Very good, Roger. Thank, Thank you, me. Doctor. Roger, joke's a joke. This cat and mouse business is getting on my nerves. Have another drink, Major. There's a spot for. Hmm. Chalk that up, Major I wonder if I can cannon off the fight now. Hmm? Send this back to the nearest British outpost to we'll Give you our word to say nothing of this. Of this peasant that you played on us. Send you back, my dear Major. I assure you, if I were ever so willing, it would be as much as my life's worth. Uh, watch this mess, eh, gentlemen. One of my favorite shots. Yes. You don't know how my subjects are looking forward to tomorrow's ceremony. You must be reasonable, my dear. I ask you no favors except for my wife's sake. But for her, we'll we make any concession. Promise you anything. What can you promise me that's worth a brass farthing? Hmm. No. Asia has long had a long score against you swaggering, blustering lords of creation. And I mean to see some of it paid tomorrow. In the meantime, gentlemen, there's no reason why we shouldn't behave like civilized beings. It's your turn, Major. I bet you a set up. Uh, let me try the red ball from the cushion. Beautiful shot. I should like to keep it from my opponent. If it were possible. There are any. Yes, Watkins. Mrs. Crispin has come downstairs. Oh, you'll sir. pardon me, gentlemen. I'll detain Mrs. Crispin only for a few moments, then she'll join you here. Uh, please continue the game. Dr. Traherne. Yes? Uh, last night to inform you, you knew nothing of the wireless. It's been reported to me there's a wireless set installed in your plane. That's true. Wireless is now a part of the same standard equipment. Unfortunately, I neglected to learn to operate it. We might have escaped being lost in the fog. And your hospitality. Doctor, I'm forced to admire your tact as well as your billiards. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Crispin. Would you please sit down? I thought my husband was here. He's in the next room playing billiards with the doctor. I trust that you slept well. More or less? More rather than less, if one may judge by your look. Does it matter? What can matter more than the looks of a beautiful woman? If you'll excuse me, I'll join my husband. Oh, pray spare me a few moments. I want to speak to you seriously. Well... I'm listening. You're very curt, Mrs. Crest, and I'm afraid you bear me malice. You hold me responsible for the darkest trying situation that you find yourself. Who else is responsible? Who? Why, chance, fate, the gods, providence. Did I bring you here? Did I conjure up the fog? When you once set foot upon the goddess's precinct, it was utterly out of my power to save you. At any rate, men of your party, if I raised a finger to thwart the goddess, 
should be the end of my rule. That's my life. What you really mean, Raj, is that you don't dare risk it. You haven't the courage. You take a mean advantage, madame. You abuse the privilege of your sex in order to taunt me with cowardice. Let us say, then, that you haven't the will to save us. But reflect one moment, madame. Why should I have the will at the risk of all I possess to save Major Creston and Dr. Traherne? Major Creston is your husband. Does that recommend him to me? Forgive me if I venture to guess that it doesn't greatly recommend him to you. He is an only too typical specimen of the breed I detest. Pig-headed, bull-necked, blustering, bearing. Dr. Traherne is agreeable enough. I guess say a man of genius. If you kill him, if you cut short his work... You kill millions of your own race, whom he would have saved. I don't know that I care very much about the millions you speak of. Life is a weed that grows again, as fast as death mows it down. At all events, he is an Englishman, a Ferengi, and I may add, without indiscretion, that the interest you've taken him, all the merest friendly interest, I'm sure, does not endear him to me. One is, after all, a man... And the favor shown to another man by a beautiful woman. Mm-hmm. Madame, think over my suggestion of last night. I do not talk to you of romantic love. I respect you too much to think you accessible to silly sentiment. But such as it is, I ask you to share my kingdom as its queen. Your son, if you bore me one, should be the prince of princes. You have the courage to die. Dear lady... Why not have the courage to live? I feel sure, madame, you might find life with me quite interesting. If you've finished, Prince, please allow me to be with my husband and my friend for what time we have left. As you wish, madame. But the privilege of changing your mind is open to the last. Allow me. <laughs> what in... Yes, Your Honor. It's occurred to me, Watkins, that perhaps it's not quite safe to have our visitors so near the wireless room. Their one chance would be to communicate with India. They appear to know nothing about wireless, but I have my doubts. It's quite possible. I want you to stay in this room and in their presence to send out a message that will startle or enrage them. We will watch their faces very closely to see if they give any sign of understanding it. Here, I've written a message in this paper. Here you are. Uh, the lady has come to terms. She will enter his highness's his household. Very good. Sir. I'll get them in here on the pretext of a little wireless demonstration, and then I'll tell you to send out an order to Tashkent for champagne. That'll be your cue. Very good, Your Highness. But afterwards, if uh, thou you were saying there was to try to correct me, Corrupt sir. you? That would be painting the lily with a vengeance. Suppose they try to bribe me, sir. What are your instructions? You may do exactly as you please. I have the most implicit confidence in you, Watkins. My grateful thanks to you, sir. I thought if I was to pretend to send a message for him, it might keep him quiet, like. Uh, very true, Watkins. It would not only keep him quiet, but the illusion of security would raise their spirits, which would be a humane action. I am always on the side of humanity. Watkins. Yes, and, uh, then I'll you, Mara. Just a moment. We shall test them now. Watch closely as you send the message. Major Creston. What is it? Uh, Watkins is just going to send a message by wireless. I thought he might amuse you and the doctor to see it work. Mrs. Creston, too, if she wishes. Very well. You coming, sir? Yes, of course. Here you are. This you see is the apparatus. Ready, Watkins? Yes, sir. Have you ordered for Tashkin? Yes, Your Highness, but I haven't told you. Oh, never mind. Even if some outsider does pick it up, I dare say we can order 12 cases of champagne without causing international complications. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for the fly signal. I help myself with some more of your excellent brandy, Roger. Anthony. By all means, Major Christian. I've got him. <laughs> May we speak? Oh, yes, yes. We won't be heard in such Have a drink, sir. No, sir. Let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. See, that's all. That's our stuff. Now, how many words did he send? What was it, Watkins? Forward by tomorrow's caravan. Twelve cases of champagne, usual brand. Charge our account. Service. That's right, sir. Twelve words. Can they really make such sense out of those blasted silly fireworks? I hope so, else we shall run short of champagne. Any orders, Your Highness? Uh, no orders, Watkins. And may I remind you, sir, that it's time for your appointment for the eye priest. Very well, Watkins. You can send word that I'm coming. Very good. And now I trust you'll excuse me for a little some arrangements for tomorrow's ceremony. Please make yourselves quite at home. What was the message? Quick. Said the lady had accepted our life on his terms. A trap for us. Anthony, you were splendid. You gave no sign. Compliment from you. Most unusual. I'll have another drink on that. I think he was fooled. 
But he wouldn't have left us here. Can we break the door to the wireless set? No good. It'd make a noise. We'd be interrupted, and then the game would be up. Then you better try to bribe what? What? We'll settle what message to send if we get the chance. Dictate. All right. Now, what about this car? Wait. Major Creston, wife, to Hearn, imprisoned roof, Raja's palace, lives in danger. No, we want something more definite. How would this do? Uh, death threatened this evening. Rescue urgent. Excellent. How do we get Watkins? There's a bell. I'll try it. Now we better decide what to do if he won't take money. And we have to use force to get his key. What shall we do with him? There's only one ring. Over the balcony. Oh, no. There's a drop of a thousand feet. Anthony. Save your sympathy, my dear, for a worthier object. Please, can't be helped. I can get three minutes of that instrument on. You ring, sir? Yes, Watkins. Uh, we want a few words with you. Oh. You mind coming over here? You don't want to speak loud. Oh. I just... I just say you can guess what we want with you. I ain't no end at guessing, sir. Rather you'd have to declaim to us propose for tomorrow. I heard his air, your numbers. He's absolutely going to intend to stand by and see us murdered. Three of your own people, and one of them a woman. What's my own people ever done for me? A woman immediately, either. No good for her. Come down to tin deck. All right. What do you take to get us out of this? Get you out of this. Why, if you was to offer me millions, how can I do that? By opening that wireless cabinet and sending this message through to the annual at I aerodrome. That's already fine, but what price have you judged off? Nothing down, no spot cash, that's clear. You have to take our word for whatever bargain we come to. Your word. Our written word. We'll give it to you in writing. Hmm. Well, that's better. Uh, what about the little first installment? You ain't quite on your uppers, are you now? You could come down with a little something, couldn't you? Be it ever so humble. I have 300 rupees and five ten pound notes. On the table, if you please. And you, Major? 250 rupees. Oh, there's some loose change. There, take your first installment. What about the balance? Should we say a thousand pounds apiece? A thousand apiece? Three thousand pounds? Oh, you're joking, Dr. Three. Well, I'd double my bid. Two thousand apiece. If your lives ain't worth five thousand apiece, yeah, there ain't nothing doing. My place here is worth fifteen thousand to me. And there's all the risk, too. I ain't charging you nothing for that. We appreciate your generosity, Watkins. Fifteen thousand it is. Now get to work quick and call it. I know Sir Right you are, ma'am. Isn't there some special service call you must send out to get Amil Sarai? Hold on there, I know it. Here it is. That's not a service call. All right, got them, sir. Now the I'm not so sure. 
The Major didn't get your SOS through. I have nothing to fear. If he did, nothing can save me. And I may as well be hanged for a wolf with a lamb. How long have we left? Till the sun's rim touches the crest of the mountain. The blast of our great mountain horn will announce the hour and you will be led to the sacred enclosure. Your Highness, will you grant us a last favor? By all means. If it is in my power. In spite of your inconsiderate action of yesterday. Considerate! Watkins, you know, poor Watkins. Great loss to me. But I bear no malice for a fair act of war. Then you'll leave us alone for the time that remains. Very well. It is quite brief, I'm afraid. And oh, by the way, you need have no fear of the ceremony being protracted. It will be brief and I trust painless. Those are my orders. And uh, before I go, madame, may I remind you of my author? Not yet too late. Till then. Au revoir. Lucilla. Yes. It will make no difference now if I tell you what I couldn't before. I knew without your telling me. We might have been very happy. It's not easy to die. Just when there's every reason to live. Perhaps easier than it was. Living without a reason. We found each other and we know. Tell me that I can think of it when they... See, just one. I love you, Mr. I love you. If only I... Back. Madame? Dr. Traherne? Oh, I regret to intrude, but the time of the ceremony has unfortunately come. I am ready. Pity, madame. The last time, must I do violence to my feelings by intruding you in the approaching ceremony? There is still time. Will you stop tormenting this lady? Remember my power, madame. If I may not take you back to my palace as my queen, I can send you back as my slave. Have you nothing to say? Nothing. I repeat my offer. Devil, I'll kill you up. You... No! Leave me out. Leave me out. Chivalrous, but ill-advised, Dr. Traherne. I regret it, and so will you. I am, for the moment, not a king, but a priest. And must observe a certain dignity. Ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> My colleagues here now insist that since you have publicly struck the chief of their sacred caste, your death alone will not appease the fury of the goddess. They insist on subjecting you to a process of expiation, a ritual of great antiquity, but... You mean torture? Well, to put it crudely, yes. Some quite remarkable combination. Oh, no! Not you, madame, not you. I must speak to you, Your Highness. Speak to you alone. Send Dr. Fahern away. Lucilla, what are you thinking of? Lucilla! I beg of you, Raj, I beg of you. One minute, no more. Very well. Lucilla! And are you? I mean, it's Lucilla! Well, madam, we have less than a minute. Let him go. Send him back to India unharmed, and it shall be as you wish. And how am I to know that you will keep your word? I must have a pledge of your good faith, for without a pledge, madam, I don't believe in it one little bit. What pledge? Only one is left. Dr. Traherne himself. I may, though it will explain my part to the uttermost, save his life while keeping him in prison. Then, when you have fulfilled your bond, you will let him go free. But the moment you attempt to evade your pledge, by death or by escape, I will hand him over to the priests to work their will with, and I will put no restraint upon their savage instincts. Choose, my dear lady. Choose. You have exactly 20 seconds. But your highness... Yes, madame? I no longer have to choose. Do I? Thank <laughs> you.
The Grand Duchess von Ferrelstein, Dr. Mrs. Basil Bohan, the Grand Duke Mitri of Croatia, Madame La Ficonte de Belfort, His Highness the Raja of Ruth, Sir Elbert of Good of you to come, Your Highness. May I present you to Lady Beatrice Sinsdale? How do you do? And Lord Sinsdale, Your Highness. How do you do? A pleasure, my lord. May I present you to Sir Holmes, the Raja Rook. Ah. I believe we've met before. Yes. Your Highness and I have met before. Under somewhat different circumstances, were they not, Mrs. Grimson? Oh, excuse me, how silly I am, Mrs. Sir the moment I'd almost forgotten the Major's heroic end. You should have any reason to remember it, Roger. I see you persist in regarding me as a murderer. What a pity, madame, your husband killed my faithful servant. His own death at my hands was a fair act of war. Say, His Majesty's government didn't do it in that light. No, no. The English government has difficulty in taking an unprejudiced view about such matters. For that reason, you now see me, madame, swelling the ranks of the kings in exile. <laughs> But I find retirement has its compensation. For instance, the, the clerical party of Rook. <laughs> no longer bothered with them. Mrs. Trillin, for the sake of old times, I have the pleasure of this war. You must excuse me, Your Highness. Well, then perhaps you and your husband would do me the honor of staying a visit in my villa at Monte Carlo. It is less picturesque than my castle in Rook, but you will find it more comfortable and, I assure you, a great deal less hazardous. I think I prefer not to impose upon your hospitality again. Now... Will you excuse me? Here is my husband. Oh, Dr. Fahern. Your Highness. How do you do, dear doctor? Hmm. Your wife and I were just having a most charming conversation. Quite like old times. Just between us men, Dr. Fahern, it was really a blessing that things turned out as they did, don't you think? You and Mrs. Fahern appear to be exceedingly happy. And I can't help but conclude that perhaps in some small way I have contributed to your happiness. And for my part, had she remained in Rook, I am now of the opinion she would have turned out to be a confounded nuisance anyway. You have been listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Green Goddess, starring Madeline Carroll and Orson Welles. In just a moment, Austin Wells will return to the microphone with Miss Carroll. But meantime, I spoke a little while ago of the popularity of tomato soup. Almost anywhere you go, you'll find this is the ruling favorite among soups. Indeed, I believe that if people could have only one kind of soup, they would choose tomato soup. And furthermore, in nearly every case, it would be Campbell's tomato soup. Now, why is this so? One reason is that it is such a versatile soup, the lively aroma and the bright glow of it back into the appetite so that it makes a tip-top beginning for dinner. There's real nourishment in it, too, making it a fine lunch or supper dish. And for extra nourishment, it may be served as cream of tomato with milk added instead of water. But the main reason Campbell's tomato soup is the world's favorite is its flavor. Just about everybody likes the tang and liveliness of it Little folk just learning to feed themselves spoon it up eagerly, and throughout their growing years it holds their favor. Men liking keen, racy foods take to this soup with enthusiasm. Women like its bright flavor, too, and its bright look on the table, and the bright greeting it receives. Yes, there's no question, but America's number one soup is Campbell's tomato. Is it number one on your weekend grocery list? It should be. And now, here's Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree with me that when Mr. Archer set out to write a melodrama, he wrote a melodrama. I'm glad, however, to report that not a single hair of Miss Carroll's lovely head has been ruffled by this evening's harrowing experience. Here she is, none the worse for it, Miss Madeline Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I might explain that Miss Carroll has just returned from a vacation trip to Europe. Miss Carroll, on behalf of these United States of America... May I say how pleased we all are to have you back? Not nearly so pleased as I am to be here tonight. Especially since I can now be the first to congratulate you on the great tribute that was paid you this week when you were voted the outstanding new radio star of the year in the Scripps Howard Radio Editor's Poll. I was very sincerely delighted to hear it. You deserve it. Well, that's very nice of you, Miss Carroll. Of course, I'm very proud, and so is everybody else in the Campbell Playhouse. And we'd like to take this opportunity to thank 
all the editors in this country and in Canada who have paid us such a fine compliment and to tell them that we shall continue to try and live up to the honor they've done us. I don't think there's any doubt of your doing that. Thanks again and good night. In tonight's Campbell Playhouse production of The Green Goddess, the role of Lucilla Crespin was played by our guest, Miss Madeline Carroll, but our job by Orson Welles. Robert Spate played Major Crespin, Ray Collins was Dr. Fairhearn. The part of Watkins was played by Eustace Wyatt, that of Dawson by Edgar Barrier. Alfred Shirley was Caldwell, and Maurice Ancrum was the high priest, the part which he played in the original production about 18 years ago. Music for the Campbell Playhouse tonight was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. And now, Orson Welles, will you tell us something about next week's story? <laughs> next week. Next week, we're doing a Broadway success of some ten years ago, Burlesque. Burlesque by James Manker Waters and that great American producer, Arthur Hopkins. Burlesque is about the show business, about a girl and her love for a ham comic, as he called himself, how she left him and how she went back to him. And it's really more than that. It's a great story of a great business. So until next Friday night when we present Burlesque, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us in the Campbell Playhouse remain obedient to yours. Campbell Soup, join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us at the Campbell Playhouse next Friday evening to hear Burlesque. Meanwhile, if you have enjoyed tonight's Campbell Playhouse presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's tomato soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. <laughs> This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.